our next keynote speaker is my friend Jose Luis Flores. Jose Luis, how are you? How are you doing? Ah, uh, we can hear you. Uh, no? I think just now, 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 now. How are you doing? Everything fine? Everything fine. Yeah, yeah. Very excited yeah. to be here, and it's a pleasure. Uh, even more after Pedro Domingo is a uh, star in this world of machine learning and so. So it's it's great to be here. Well, you're you're a star too. You are a star too. So it's uh, <laughs> your, your your presentation is probably one of the most expected because you are talking about epi epidemiology, about tracing contacts, about I think probably the stuff that is more interesting nowadays for someone that is uh, dealing with uh, artificial intelligence. So uh, I, I, I don't want to take your time. So it's uh, your turn now, your 30 minutes to, to talk about this, but something important for our audience. You can make questions. We are uh, insisting all the time on this. So make questions in Spanish, in English. Español está bien también. Podéis hacer preguntas en español. Os cuesta a veces en inglés. We will make our best to translate them. So it's uh, English is fine. Spanish is fine too. So it's, uh, we are waiting for your questions. So, José Luis, gracias y tu tiempo. Muchas gracias. Well, thank you for, for this glad invitation. As I said, you, I'm really very excited to be, to be here with you in this event to talk about something that I think is it's interesting because of this uh, difficult situation we are, we are facing. Uh, well, as you see, I, I, I've chosen to start my presentation with this, with this image. It can be a cave painting, 13 thousand years years ago. I think it's, it's, it's a good way to start in the sense that it's, it's quite extraordinary and, and, and also disturbing. Now it represents uh, probably the ancestral dream of, of trying to, to survive. No? It seems even that they are even greeting us uh, from, from the past with these hands moving. Uh, and I, I think it's interesting to, to, to stay a while thinking in the vulnerability uh, because of the nature of the disease of these people in, in the past. No? They, they only could explain this because of kind of uh, living uh, punishment. No? And we now think in these uh, ancient, uh, of these uh, ancestors no? uh, with the mindset of uh, probably a superior piece you know, in the sense that we know much more about what, what is uh, the nature, uh, the disease and so, but things like the one that is right happening now to, uh, makes us think that well, no, we are not the owners of the nature and we are only a part of, of it. We are facing a, a, a very big challenge that is quite quite clear. Right? Probably all, all the generations have to, to face their, their own challenges, no? but, but in this case I think we are facing two actually. One is the tremendous change that we are living because of the technology in all the aspects of our life, our society and our work and so. I know this new thing, you know, the, the thing of the, of the epidemic that is, uh, has uh, had a tremendous impact for, for the life of, of, of everyone. No? Um, in December 2019, we start uh, having some uh, quite diffuse information coming from China, speaking about uh, respiratory disease. And probably it was not so alarming because some was something that has happened in the, in the past you know, with the MERS, with the SARS before. And normally these uh, outbreaks uh, were quite limited, weeks, months, yeah, uh, but quite local in certain areas of the world, in certain regions. You know? And well, at some point we started uh, receiving information about not only about uh, the people who were uh, ill, but also about deaths. The number of deaths were, was increasing for an, uh, an exponential pattern that's quite, quite normal in this kind of situations. And what made the process even more uh, terrible for us in our uh, occidental mindset was that we start to have these problems in our, in our own home, in Spain, in Italy, in different countries of, of Europe, uh, Latin America, the US. And I think it was the first time in, in our recent history when we realized that something, a threat, could uh, harm ourselves. No? Because in the past, when we talk about terrorist attacks, normally these attacks were in, in other countries or were quite limited in time. Or when we thought, uh, when we think in, in, in the tsunami was in, in very far regions, no? This is the first, the very first time we feel that we are vulnerable, no? And this is something that makes us so similar to this 
ancient uh, people in the in the past. No? Well, uh, my, my intention during, during this presentation is uh, speaking a little bit about data science, about epidemiology, and why not about my own experience as a data scientist in terms of how we manage this, this crisis. I had the opportunity to, to lead a team together with people at Fragon, people at Minset, in collaboration with, uh, with the Spanish government to, to put some solutions, some technological solutions on the, on the, on the table. I think it's been uh, a, a very interesting journey, very challenging one. Uh, what we are living is a, is a big drama, and, and well, uh, I want to share with you my, 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 my thoughts. And, and I want to start speaking about uh, this epidemiological uh, quantitative analysis. No? In, the, in the last century, in the, in, the, in the 20s of the last century, was the first time we started to apply mathematics to understand the behavior of a, such a complicated model as the, as the evolution and the spread of a disease. In 1920, uh, Lovka and Volterra started with a model that uh, was able to, uh, to measure and to understand the equilibrium and the balance between prey and predators in an ecosystem. And based on these results, we started in the, also in the 20s, with the SIR model. The SIR model is a model about the susceptible guys, guys who can be infected, infected ones, and they recover it. And it's based in a set of uh, differential uh, equations. Differential equations are really useful because they are allowed to analyze how uh, an event, a behavior, uh, something that is happening is varying on the, on the time. And this is what we try to do with the epidemiological models. We, we want to understand when something that is linear that at the beginning normally is, it doesn't seem to be to be dangerous when it start to have higher volatility and this volatility start to have a, a chaotic uh, behavior now this is what what we try to do chaotic behavior and then an exponential an exponential growth well uh, the good thing about the uh, 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 differential equations and the SIR model to 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 explain or to understand the quantitative aspects of a, of, a, of a disease, of a pandemic in this case, is they are really very, really very flexible and very adaptable. Because the solution of, of this system of equations is a set of functions, is a set of yeah, family functions called exponential curves based on several parameters. The, the, the parameters can be different. In some cases, is the, the number of contacts, is the, the number of infected individuals, the window of infection, and the duration of the immunity. So you can establish different, different conditions. And basically the idea is once you have a contact, you measure the probability of this contact to generate a new infected, a new positive. And this has to do with the information you have about how this infection happens. But at the end, the solution is always a set of exponential uh, functions with different parameters, as the parameters I mentioned previously. The advantage of this is the, it's very versatile, very adaptable, and that is also the problem, it's also the trap. I, I have seen during the last months the emergency of many, many, many different approaches based on differential equations um, created by uh, research centers, by engineers, by data scientists. I even received some uh, letter some emails of people saying I have a model that adapts very well what is uh, what is uh, to what is happening right now um, in all the cases what normally happens is people consider that the certification of the goodness of the of the model is the fact that the model adjusts very well and matches uh, switches very well historical data no? but of course data are historical it's something that has happened and this set of uh, equations is very, very flexible and very adaptable. And as a consequence, it, it is something that you can get. You can define the right parameters to tell the story. No? So that's, that's really very, very, very interesting. But what is a different thing is if you're able to make predictions with this, with this model. And this is something that is not possible in general. Sometimes you make a prediction and it's okay. But if you are right once, it's quite difficult to write twice. And the reason is the reality is much more complicated than the model we have created. A model is a simplification of the reality. We need to simplify the reality 
Because if not, we cannot comp com compute and we cannot make calculations. No? So as a consequence of that, we try to go to a formulation that is much simpler than, than the observation, that the reality. We also have a lack of data that then allow us to, to have all the, all the information we require. No? So that, that's the point. Uh, I think now as, as human beings, uh, we are obsessed with two different things. One is telling stories and the other one is accounting. Counting how many people, how many cows, how many infected guys. These are the two obsessions of the people. And this is also the obsession of the data scientists. The good data scientist uses data to uh, calculate, to count. Huh? And with these numbers, with this uh, information, it's able to tell a story. But sometimes happen just the opposite. We have a story to tell, and we torture the data until the data say this is a story we want to we want to share. And this is the danger with this kind of model. Something that happens with some of the data scientists working in this space right now, because you, you have the the sensation of well, I, I, I can have the power to control what is happening, but it's something that is happening probably so more often with, the, with our politicians. Um, well, the top-down approach has these, uh, these problems. Huh? It's difficult to make predictions in the, in the short term. It's impossible to make predictions in the medium term and in the long term. It's a chaotic uh, phenomenon. It's the same problem that we face when we try to make a forecast of the weather for the, last, for the, next, sorry, for the next month. It's impossible. You can make a good prediction probably for the next two days, three days, but probably no more than that. No? Here happens something very similar. Very similar. So this is one of the limitations we are facing. I, I, I will be is a, talking about limitations in the first part of the of the presentation, and then we, we try to to find some solutions. Probably not to solve this problem of chaos, of chaos in the in the phenomenon we want to predict because it's something unavoidable. But in terms of how we can use data to take the decisions, um, there are other types of. Of, of, of approaches when, when trying to, to, to understand the continuous in, in this kind of models. This is a reference, this is a, a, a good example, a graphical example, that this is quite good to understand how these differential equation models we're using uh, work. And when you see this, you see, well, that's, that's fantastic, no? because you have exponential growth, first it's linear, then, then this phase of exponential growth, then you have a plateau, and then probably goes down. Uh, yeah, but think that what you have here is a Brownian uh, movement, something that is quite random. It doesn't represent the, the reality of a, social, of a social behavior. So we have other methods to, to try to solve this. No? And in the last years, and it, it has been great to have before Pedro Domingos because he has done a great job in this area, we also use social network analysis you're trying to understand the, this phenomenon of, of influence. No? How, when you have a group of people infected, how this infection is going to be spread on a, on a population according with the social relationship. And that's it's very important. We have not talked now about particles with a Brownian movement, and then there are interactions following some, some law, but there is a social relationship among the people, and we want to, let's say, uh, try to understand and, and and define what's the, what kind of relationship are, are, are they. Well, in the network model, uh, basically, basically we have the nodes. Each node is a, is, a, is a person, it's an individual. You have some of them who are infected, other are not infected, the blue ones. Then you have a probability to infect. And here, basically, you have two different approaches. One is the classical epidemiological approach. In the classical approach, I have a probability to infect you. The other guy has a probability to infect you. And it's like if we were uh, using uh, uh, a random uh, event to say, I can infect you or not. And then you, you apply the same, the same, the same event. You're, you're uh, launching a, a coin or something like that. No? If it's, uh, one thing is, 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 is infected, is, is the other is, is not infected. No? So this is the classical approach, but the classical approach doesn't take into account the characteristic of its node, how this person is, what's the kind of relationship among the people. We are very close friends, we are acquaintances, we are relatives, we, we know uh, rarely because we, we have uh, been in the same place a couple of times. 
or is the first time I see this this guy? No, it's it's it's, it's very difficult. No, it's, sorry, very different in, in one case and the other. And you don't have information about the context of the interaction. We are together in a party, in the charts, in the school, at the office, uh, in the in the in the vast. So this is very valuable information to being able to to model what is happening uh, behind. So. So well, basically, what what we're trying to to know is when I have a set of infected people, these three guys, you say K guys, V1, V2, VK in the in the graph. What's the number of of people who is going to become infected after a time t? Sometimes your objective is to to maximize this number because you want to sell something and you are using a viral marketing uh, uh, strategy, or in this case, you you try to say what happened if the majority of the infection is happening at home or is happening in the in the shop or is happening in the school. No? So it gives, it gives you not, not, not only the capability to make a prediction in terms of numbers, but also to make a prediction in terms of where the content, the content is happening. And this is a, something qualitative that is tremendously relevant to make uh, predictions. The problem of this, the main problem of this is data you require huge amount of data. You have to create a network of sensors to gather all, all this information. But we have a problem with, with this uh, approach of social networks. And here we have a, a problem again. I, I repeat the story of the data scientists, putting the numbers before the story, or putting the story before the numbers. That's very important. Because what happens is this. In order to understand and to measure the future impact of a set of people who has the disease in the in the moment t was equal zero, and and what is going to happen in moment t? Yeah? Um, I require to know a, a function of influence, an influence function. Influence function that means that when I have a group of people with a disease infect, infected, what uh, what is the number of people that I will infect in the future in this time t? This is the influence function. And we, as mathematicians, we ask for two properties for, uh, to this function. The first property is that it has to be a monotony increasing function. That means that the number of people infected of a group A is bigger than the ones infected by a group B, where the group B is part of the group A. And it seems quite, quite natural. No? You say, well, I have more people infected. And then this that, uh, the group A that is bigger than the group B, the group B is included in the A, the effect in terms of new uh, infections is going to be smaller. It seems natural. The second one is called submodularity. It's a property that is very important in mathematics, and especially it's very important when we talk about optimization, maximizing or, or, or the opposite. Uh, there was a problem. Uh, and here, when we talk about some modularity, we say the, this thing. We say that the marginal impact in terms of, uh, of, uh, of contagious of an individual X is decreasing according to the size of the group where this individual is, is increasing. It's called a law of diminishing returns. Okay? And here we have a problem. And the problem is, uh, when you are talking about, for instance, a physical interaction, and an example of physical interaction is you have a grid with ferromagnetic particles with different uh, spins, and according with the, with, the, with the magnetic field, they can modify, when one particle can modify the, 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 the spin of the, of the neighbors. And then it's something that happens, yes or yes, it happens the same, the same way, it's deterministic. And this way, it's true that this similarity is happening. But when you are talking about something that is social, some modularity has been shown, and we have some research on this area, talking about some modularity in the spread of behaviors in a telco operator, for instance, and some modularity doesn't, doesn't happen. It doesn't happen at the, local, at the local level, or it doesn't happen always. We use some modularity from a mathematical perspective because there is a very interesting theorem that uh, says that if some modularity happens in the influence function, then we can use a very simple optimization uh, algorithm in order to get a very good uh, result, a very accurate result in terms of the number of future 
uh, contagious that this group of eight people is going to is going to make in, in, the, in the time t. But when similarity doesn't happen, we don't know anything. Everything can happen. Everything is chaotic, and this is what happens in a social behavior. What's our surprise? Our surprise is when a disease is a pandemic disease, the behavior of the, of the disease is not an epidemiological uh, behavior, it's a social behavior. Because what is more important to determine the uh, impact of the, of, the, of the disease in terms of new contagious, in terms of, in terms of close contact, in terms of what, of what is the context of this new context, is your social behavior. So what that means? That means that we, we cannot do anything because we don't, we lack of instruments. No, means two things. First, predictions are really very hard. It doesn't matter the kind of approach, are really very hard. I, I would say that predictions in the middle of the are not possible. But if we can gather data about the type of uh, relationship, the type of, uh, uh, of uh, context of the contact, we can give you information, very rich information about what's the probable impact of this of this behavior in the future of the disease, in the future of the epidemic. But again, I repeat, this requires a lot of data and require a network of sensors. That's one of the main uh, aspects or concepts I want to share. A network of sensors, sensors about the uh, behavior of uh, the citizens of the of the individuals. It's not enough to, uh, to have isolated cases. There, there is a case and there is a paper that says that there was a, there were a wedding, uh, there was a wedding with 50, 55 attendees, uh, 200 infections, seven deaths in level two and level three relationship. It's great to have this because it gives you a clue about what is happening or the kind of variables you require to, to, to gather. No? But at the end, what you need is a systematic, a systematic approach to gather all this information. Well, based on, on this, we started uh, an initiative in March this year. And we work in, a, in an application for our citizens uh, called uh, COVID Monitor. COVID Monitor uh, was what is called a geo-tracking uh, solution. Basically, what this uh, uh, application uh, uh, does is this. First, you, can, you, you, could download, uh, you could download the application, it was anonymous, you don't have to enter any, any kind of personal data uh, about who, who you are. Then you uh, add information about your symptoms, about, uh, about you, what's your, 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 your state you know, at, at, at the moment when you introduce the app and you can update this information in, in the time. And what is quite interesting is with this application, we can follow each citizen Using a geo tracking, using GPS, uh, GPS location. Okay. Uh, we do the, the, the same with all the people who has uh, who have the, the the application, and this allow us to create heat maps of people in different places, and according with the symptomatology that we are, we have from the from the people, or even if we have uh, positive cases, confirmed positive cases, we could create. Uh, a metric, and I think with, you know, it's a very interesting metric for the citizens. It's a metric of the exposure the, to the to the virus. Your exposure is low, your exposure is high. Depends on what you're doing. If you're staying at home and you're staying at home uh, since two or three, four weeks, your exposure is going to be low. If you are walking your pet, your exposure is going to be a little bit higher. You're going into a place where there are a lot of people and some of these people have a, a, like, a, like, a, a high risk, then your exposure is going to increase. So it, it gave a way to, to measure the degree of exposure of, of each person. No? And having to account that we knew where, what was the exposure, not only of, of a device, a person, but also the exposure of a place, we were able to say, well, if you have to go uh, for shopping in the, next, in the next hour, two hours, this is the, the, be the best time to go, this is the best time to walk to your dog, or, or so and so. No? So it was a, kind, uh, a way to give something, something valuable, some information to the end user. Um, well, the thing is 
it, it happens the same in the running apps, you know, as you, you have information about your accumulated exposure, you have information about your in instant exposure, you have information about the number of people uh, that has been close to you in the last in the last hours, the number of people has been close to you with a high probability. We, we defer the, the sending of this information to, to avoid uh, any any risk to, to no information all third parties. Okay, but but th this was this was the idea. And the idea was trying to understand where the close counters happened and where the, the positive cases or where was the correlation between behavior and activity and the positive cases. This was the main the main idea of this solution. Uh, we have I repeat more than 200,000 points of interest, schools, transportation networks, charge offices, supermarkets, and so on. The first thing, probably some of you, and, 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 and I think it's also a consequence of the, of the noise in our uh, society re related to this kind of, uh, of technologies in the, last, in the last months, probably some of you say, well, I don't want a, an application being able to track and to know where I am. I, I don't trust in this kind of application, even if the, if the government is behind of that, or sometimes because of that, you know, the, the people the, the, the don't, don't trust so much. You know? Well, the thing is, and I want to start with, uh, with the ethical dilemma here. No? We face a, an important dilemma uh, putting uh, as confrontational two different, two different concepts. One was privacy, the other, was, the other one so was uh, freedom. No? Or, or, and, and, and basically this is what, what happened. No? People said, no, all the tracking apps are forbidden. In all Europe, in all the world, the application, the geolocation apps were forbidden. I think the, 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 the debate was not very, very poor. I think to some extent, I'd say the debate was uh, very polarized in, in two different groups, the black and the white group, without any kind of, of gray. The thing is, first, you don't need personal information. Second, we don't need information about where is your exact location at, uh, at, at each uh, time. Third, the computation can happen in your own uh, device. So the only information we require is a profiling of the type of activity behind of you. Okay? So, and, and we can give all the transparency to these kind of apps. Why we think this kind of app shouldn't have been uh, discarded yeah, and, 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 and where, and not only in Spain, Arabia, but in, in, in all the international community. Because we have mathematical models and technical solutions to solve all the privacy statements and all the privacy doubts that we can, that we can face. One is uh, using an hyper, a projection of the, of the, the dimensional GPS information in a multidimensional space, in a higher, higher dimensional space, uh, Keeping the property of 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 closenesses of of, of uh, being far or being away in the, in the new in the new projection, and second because we can control what is happening in your device and what is happening in a central server, and with these two elements, we are able to to control the the the, 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 the privacy of the entire process. What is the advantage of this? The, the advantage is mainly that we can understand. What is happening? What is the impact of certain type of close encounter? We can answer the question of what have uh, what we have to do with the restaurants, with the schools, with the with the, with the hospitals. What are the, the the best practices? And so this is something that we don't have now. We are blind, and we are blind because in this very polarized debate, what's happened was something like like this. This is Peter Thiel. This is uh, one of the. Uh, this is CEO of Palantir. He's uh, is a very well-known investor in Silicon Valley, and he said something that was extremely uh, provocative, but uh, but probably true. Uh, at least in the mindset of some of somebody. You know? He said, "Crypto is libertarian and AI is communist." So, what he says is the kind of polarization we are living also with technology. There was not. Uh, the dilemma based on science, based on technology, was based on on, on feelings, or was based on on basically on, on opinions, but without any any kind of solid foundation. With our current uh, mastering of the 
technology, we can do almost everything. We can keep the information as private as, 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 as the society could require, but we don't have to renounce to have good information about the disease. My own question is, what would, how would happen if the disease would be worse? And instead of uh, having two three percent of that, we, we had I don't know thirty percent, forty percent. That's just my my first question. So the solution, and I repeat again, not only in Spain but in all the countries, was a contact tracing solution, contact tracing apps, and it's great if we have uh, the critical mass that we require to have this close. Uh, contacts uh, happen you know, between people who is infected and people who can be infected because has a, has a stay long time have stayed long time with some someone infected. It's a contact tracing. I think anyone knows how this works. We are using here in Spain the DP3T uh, protocol created by by a group of university research center, the University of Lausanne, but uh, many many others. It's great because it preserves the privacy all happens in the mobile telephone all happens with absolute privacy it's, it's absolutely great the effort we have done to create this app for the spanish government has been has been great we've been in a rush all the time because it's really very high demanding it's i think it's also milestone for the spanish government to, to have launched uh, an app that currently is open source i think the openness is one of the most important things in this kind of, of technologies and the technology is great when you have, uh, uh, when you declare a positive, you are sending the information about your keys to all the people who were, who were quite close to you during the, during the last days. If you stay more than 15 minutes, uh, less uh, than two meters than you, then you're going to receive a, an alert. Problem of this, you have to download the app, you have to, uh, you, you have to have the, uh, the app uh, uh, open, working. No? And of course, you have to you have to add your your positive uh, key, no, your your, your code, no? and that makes that it's not being very intense in terms of use. In the past three four months ago, it was said that you require sixty percent of population using the app. Now we think that probably with twenty percent is enough, but that is really very very challenging. Um, but from an epidemiology point of view, uh, the problem of the contact tracing app is not the, the technology itself, it's the fact that uh, different states, Germany, France, United Kingdom, and, and some others in Europe and the States have their own ideas about how to deploy this, this application. And there were also two models, the centralized model and the decentralized model. In the centralized model, the information about the close encounters was in a central server and the authorities were able to see where, what, what was happening. Now we have longer chains, so probably something bad is going to happen very quickly because we have a long uh, chance of transmission, for instance. No? But the thing is, uh, there is the, the other perspective, and it's the decentralized one. In this decentralized one, all this information is stored in your own device. All this local network is stored in your own device. We don't have a, a central repository with all the network and understanding all the behavior, what is happening and so on. And this is an important limitation from an epidemiology point of view. This was something that uh, was the, the, this way because of the strong position of Google and Apple. At the end of the day, Google and Apple, they were the, the owners of the operating system in the majority of the mobile telephones. And as a consequence, they said, well, this is the way this is going to work for us. The, Privacy of our clients is a, is, a, is a top priority, and this is what we are going to do. To do, to do. There were some uh, response: Germany, France, United Kingdom, uh, but all of them they had to to say, "Well, yeah, uh, we don't have any other option but doing what what you say," because at the end, the power is the power of the of the corporations. And here, also from an ethical point of view, this is something that we should think about no? because there is a very important lack of confidence in the states. When, when the states is asking for, for you to download an app, people say, well, what's the kind of information my government wants from me? I don't trust my government. You don't trust my, in your government, but you're trusting in big corporations in a foreign country 
and you don't ask questions to this, to this, to these corporations. And this is what happened. All the people said, oh, we want uh, the code, the code has to be open, we have, we have to audit the code. It's great, I, 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 I firmly believe in, 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 in openness, but the thing is, why are not we asking for the same transparency with the, with the big firms, you know, with the big players, with the Googles, with the, with the Apples of the world? No? That's, that's a, an important question. As you see, contact tracing is happening almost in all the countries in the world. Uh, we don't have now uh, an information about if it's being useful or not to fight against the, the COVID. My, the only thing I'd say is, I think there were much better solutions from an epidemiology point of view. And even if you, want, if you have to work in a limited population, even if you, you have to give some kind of reward, I don't know, but having this information is so extremely important that we should do something to have this information about how the spread, how the, the, the chance of transmissions, how is the context of the, of the closing context when a transmission and a contagious happen. This is very important. But I, I don't want to be negative. Eh? I think we have uh, evolved a lot during the last, during the last uh, months, uh, talking even about the, the governments and the relationship of the governments with the civil society. And of course, speaking also about the civil society itself, there is a movement called the Volunteer Technical Unit that is happening in different countries all around the world. This is a movement that started in, in New York eh, at the beginning of the, of the, of the pandemic. And it's very interesting because it's also happening in Spain. And here, engineers, engineers uh, mathematics, physicists, and so, they are collaborating in order to create solutions for the problem. Solutions like the CAD air calculator, this is a very nice initiative that allows us to uh, parameterize and set up the air purifiers in order to reduce the probability of COVID to stay in the, in the air. You, you know the problem of the air results and this kind of things. You have apps for small commerce trying to help them to survive because it's very difficult for them to survive with it. They, they don't have in a single uh, website. Uh, they are proposing improvements in the COVID uh, contact tracing apps we are using you know, in the different countries in order to improve the, 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 the results and the performance, in order to measure in a, in a better way. You know, this uh, Bluetooth low energy app monitor that allows us to measure what, what is happening behind. They are fighting very hardly for having open in information. And, and I think probably is one of the, the best things that have happened during this pandemic. You know, people trying to put their, their talent at the service of the society, trying to find new solutions and new ways to, to do things. And finally, uh, which are the lessons for, for the future? I think the first lesson in spirit reporting is openness, transparency, and flexibility. When uh, we, as, as, a, as a society, work together, when the government is able to trust in the, in the, in the experts, in people working in research centers, in, in companies, and so on, putting their, their talent and their best intention, to give solutions, I think it's great. But this is not something that ha can happen in a very chaotic way. You need, you need a government for that. And I'm, I'm seeing a government in terms of the method to being able to create where in the, within the interdisciplinary groups. Right? This interdisciplinary collaboration requires a space and a way to be, to be done. Third, it's important to avoid false dilemmas. Uh, privacy against freedom, privacy against security. Right? It's, it's not a true dilemma. Uh, it's being a dilemma that has been fueled by politicians, by citizens with not very technical background. And as, as experts in data, as data scientists and so, I think we have to help people understand that technology allows us to make many, many different different things and we can improve a lot in the, in the kind of information and the kind of models and the kind of, of answers we can give with, uh, with good data. And that's the fourth point. Epidemiology requires data. I read one, one thing during the pandemic and probably was the worst thing I, I read. It was a pan, uh, an epidemiologist saying that they don't require data. Uh, even he spoke about digital epidemiology saying that. I think this is not true. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm the uh, on the opposite position. We require data and the data we have is not, uh, are not very good. 
Sometimes even counting the number of that is not easy. The criterion used is, diff is, is different in one region and the other. Even with, uh, with uh, sometimes it's because of political interest, in some other cases because of criteria, well, it depends, but the quality of the data, even very, very basic data, it has been really very, very poor, and it's something that we have to improve a lot. Because if we compare, and this is my, my last slide, if we compare what, what happened here 100 ago, uh, in the left you see the Spanish flu in the 19, uh, uh, 18, and in the right you see Ifema Palace in 2020. Yes, we've improved a lot. If you compare with the, with the, with our ancestors in the in the caves, we probably have learned a lot. But we could uh, have made this much better. And this is my 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 last thought. As a data scientist, I think there are long long space to improve and to make things better. So that's all from my side. Thank you, and take care, other you. Thank you, thank you, Jose Luis. Uh, let, let me make a couple of a couple of questions. The, the, the first one is, uh, well, you, you, you talk uh, in your presentation about different reactions in different countries. I, I like to know your your opinion about local reaction here in Spain and how the Spanish government has has used uh, this kind of tools, uh, including apps, by the way. Uh, to, 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 to react uh, to this crisis. In, in your opinion, is our app good enough? It could be better. Uh, for, for the next time, the probability that there will be a next time, uh, what kind of things we should change in this, uh, in the use we have made of, of data? Yeah. Well, I think our app, rather COVID, is, is the same kind of app you can find in France and Germany and other countries is is the same basically because you have the same protocol. So uh, basically, you're 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 talking about the same the same app. It's like a clone uh, from this uh, point of view. Okay. Uh, I, I I want to say uh, to, that uh, in the uh, development of this app using the, the DP three three T protocol, we found that uh, parts of this protocol were not very mature and. And we have played a very active role uh, to create new, new, new code, new libraries, and so to make this more, more robust. No? So it's, it's something that we, here in, in Spain we have uh, had a, a good contribution, but it is the same in other countries. The problem is not the, the Spanish deployment of the of the app. I think the problem is the app itself. You see, uh, the, the big question is if contact tracing is going to be useful. But the same problem is in Spain or is in other countries. We don't have a, a less usage of the app than if you compare with other countries like Germany. And Germany is a very good reference. So it's something that we have to we have to check. Probably uh, in the next months there are going to be more downloads of the app. There are going to be more positive cases. Madrid and Catalonia have introduced their their healthy systems in the in the app quite quite recently. So well, let, let us see. I have my my reservation on that, and that's the reason why. Um, all with my with my answer, I I, I propose uh, a more aggressive uh, approach. The last one, Jose Luis, because you, you, you were talking about this uh, dilemma, this false dilemma that it's uh, trying to debate or to choose between uh, freedom or privacy or between uh, health and uh, transparency. Uh, do you think yes. that this debate uh, has, has changed with this pandemic? That after all this, after COVID. But probably the public debate will be different. That our opinion, our feelings um, about the use of, of our data will change after all this. Unfortunately, I don't think so. Uh, I think uh, there is a, a political uh, underlying uh, 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 behavior, no? in the sense that it's quite, it's quite. Uh, if you are you belong to this party or your ideas belong to this party then you have to be uh, okay with this or if not it's the opposite no so when you have this kind of black or white approach it's very difficult it's very difficult to solve something because when a, com a problem is is complicated the solution normally is in the middle is it's a combination of, of grace and and i think the population in spain is, is quite polarized and is it still polarized yeah uh, the, the answers are, as usual, the, the answers are more complex than, than this uh, white or black debate. 
So thank you, Jose Luis, for being yeah. for being with us and sharing your your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.